Chapter Five: The Visitor. Morning Star Castle stood high upon the rocky cliffs, overlooking the ocean like a brilliant lighthouse in the fog. The castle was, in fact, built upon the remains of a cyclopean lighthouse left from days when giants had ruled those lands after their great battle with the tree lords. Within the ancient lighthouse was a magnificent lens, fashioned by a crafty dwarf by the name of Fresnel. The lens resembled a giant crystal jewel, and it cast a brilliant light that guided the ships safely away from the rocky ships, cliffs. The castle was intentionally built not to look dissimilar from the original lighthouse. It was fashioned with gloriously cut windows, so the lights within would also function as beacons. But to see a Morning Star castle properly, to truly experience its beauty, one must see it on solstice from a distance while transferring, tra traversing the sea. Sailors and fishermen would journey out of their way, sometimes by tremendous distance, says, just to see the castle, referring to by most of the lighthouse of the gods. The Morning Star clan was a well-respected family, always willing to help those in need. And of course, they were great friends to those who sailed the per perilous seas, often giving aid to anyone who washed upon, washed up on their shores, shipwrecked, or lost their way on long journeys. Indeed, they were one of the few royal families without enemies, and they generally got on well with the other kingdoms they encountered. But their closest allies were the kingdoms under the seas, for they depended on the sea gods for their well-being. King Morningstar had long before made an agreement with the sea witch who dwelled in those waters that he wouldn't interfere with her kingdom, and she in turn wouldn't meddle with it, wouldn't meddle with his. Unlike her brother, who detested humans for fishing his seas, Ursula was rather more relaxed on the matter. As long as the Morningstar's fishermen stayed within their spe specified boundaries. And those boundaries were within Ursula's domain, the unprotected waters. Her brother had no jurisdiction there. The agreement was to everyone's benefit, and while the Morning Stars held to their portion, the Sea Witch saw no reason to break hers. So she hadn't broken their agreement when she found the king's daughter, Princess Tulip, after she had thrown herself off her father's rocky cliffs. She was, after all, under the sea and in Ursula's domain. And the princess was all too eager to take Ursula's deal, her beauty and and voice in exchange for her life. When Tulip looked back at that terrible experience, it was as if it were another lifetime. She was looking back now as she curled up on the window bench of the sunny morning room, drinking her tea, with Ursula's distinct, distant voice ringing in her ears. Well, well, my dear, are we so broken-hearted as that? Is the loss of that terrible prince really worth your life? No, I've made a terrible mistake. Yes, you have, my sweet. But I can help you. There are just two things I will need in exchange: your beauty and your voice. Tulip was happy to fling her beauty away. It was the very thing that had caused her such misery. It seemed no one except for her beloved nanny. Ever consider Tulip's other attributes? The Beast Prince loved Tulip only for her, for how her beauty would reflect upon him. She was expected to sit idly, always looking beautiful, and saying nothing, while while he did what he willed, and she had filled the role remarkably. She cringed, thinking about what a fool she had made of herself in those months. Horrified, she had allowed the prince to treat her so shabbily. That was what be beauty had brought her: heartbreak, humiliation, and without it, without her beauty, Tulip could focus on what made her herself. Life meant so much more to her than she had ever realized, and her voice, well, it had gotten her into nothing but trouble. She was happy to be rid of it, happy not to have to make small talk, or frankly, to have to talk at all. After that day by the sea. She had decided to be done with the business of being a princess, no more fancy balls or being carted off to meet men of royalty. Certainly, no more engagements to awful cads. 
Her parents begged her to reconsider the idea of a good marriage, and she almost re relented out of guilt. As much as she wanted to help her father's kingdom by marrying some wealthy prince, she couldn't fathom another terrible, brutish man in her life. No, she wouldn't allow it. She had set her mind quite firmly on the matter and decided she liked her life exactly as it was when an enchanting young woman named Circe came to negotiate with the sea witch for the return of Tulip's beauty. But I don't want it. I don't want to be beautiful, Tulip screamed. Circe was beside herself. She almost regretted having convinced Ursula to return Tulip's voice just moments before. But my dear, it belongs to you. It's yours. I've got something for the sea, which she will want much more than your beauty, and I dare say you won't have much choice in the matter. The deal is sealed, as they say. She may not have the item until your beauty is returned, and I guarantee Ursula would destroy the entire pan pantheon to get at it. Much to Tulip's horror, she was once again beautiful by the next morning. It was like some sort of twisted fairy tale, all confused and backward. You see, once Tulip had her beauty back, and this Circe girl had seen to it that Tulip would be in possession of a wealthy dowry, every prince from every kingdom was traveling to Morningstar Castle to ask for Tulip's hand in marriage. Once Tulip would have delighted in being fawned over, but she was now eager to dismiss the file and pathetic men who did the fawning. Tulip was content to spend her days sitting with her nanny or reading books from her library. She had gotten used to the way life had been in those days before Circe's visit. The silence of the room as she read about adventurous, brave young women escaping their terrible stepmothers, or the dark fairy who put a spell on a young girl for her own protection. She had liked not having to speak, and for the first time, she had truly spent time with herself, not worrying about impressing this prince or that, or wondering if she'd said the wrong thing at dinner, or worn the shade of pink that best brought out the color of her che in her cheeks. She never felt happier in her life, or more content. Nanny brought her out of her thoughts when she padded into the room. What's this, Nanny? Tulip asked, looking at the basket Nanny was holding. It was bedded Bedecked with a bunch of pretty pink roses that looked fearfully familiar. Well, I don't know, child, but it's clearly from that loathsome kingdom. Nanny was speaking, of course, of the ghastly prince to whom Tulip had once been engaged. They had heard he had since changed his ways and fallen in love with a remarkable young woman named Belle. Apparently, they were very much in love and were living quite happily together. Tulip found that hard to believe based on how the prince had treated her. But she also recalled meeting Belle at the prince's ball and noted to herself that she wasn't the sort of woman who would stand to be mistreated. If anyone could bring about a change within the prince, it would be a woman who could stand up for herself in a way Tulip never could. She hoped they were happy together, the prince and Belle, and she appreciated the letter the prince had sent to her shortly after his marriage, begging Tulip for her forgiveness and promising to make things right with her father. She quite frankly couldn't imagine the prince writing such a letter and was surprised when her father later shared the news that the prince had indeed made good on his word. As gallant as his actions had been, she couldn't banish from her mind or heart the foul things he had done to her, and she decided it was best to avoid any further correspondence with the lout. You don't think it's from him, do you? Tulip slipped was quivering at the mere thought of that nasty beast she had almost married. I shouldn't think so, dear. Perhaps it's from old M Mrs. Potts. She was awfully fond of you. Princess Tulip laughed at her nanny's calling anyone old Mrs. anything. Her nanny, whom she loved deeply, was impossibly old and resembled a withering, withered apple doll with her shriveled and heavily lined powdery white skin and her brilliant s silver hair. She was short, shrunken with age, and slightly stooped, but with a fierce personality and a spark in her eye. Open it, my dear, open it! Tulip looked at the package suspiciously and decided to open it as gingerly as she could, fearful there might be something dangerous inside. But she was happily surprised. Florence! 
My dear girl, I missed you. Flans was a beautiful black, white, and orange cat the princess had grown to love during her stays with the prince when they had been engaged. Sometimes the cat had been her only companion while the prince had gone off to the tavern to drink with Gaston, leaving her alone and weary at his every opportunity. She had mourned the loss of Flans's companionship in the many long months since all that wickedness had transpired with the prince. But, uh, all, but as she had mused earlier, that was a lifetime before. She sometimes looked back at herself, feeling stupid and foolish for having allowed the prince to treat her as he had. Well, that will never happen again, she thought as she petted Flans. Lately, she made it her business to learn something of the world. No more fumbling for the right word or giggling rather than taking part in a conversation. She was a new woman, and she'd never been happier. Oh, Nanny, it's my flaunts, Tulip sque squealed. I don't like it, my girl, not one bit. I won't have anything from that accursed place in our home. Flaunts gave Nanny a terrible look, but she knew that Nanny wasn't like most humans. She saw things others did not. Flaunts wouldn't be surprised if Tulip's dear nanny was a witch, who had lost her powers and memories long before, but had an inkling of magic still within her. Nanny, no, it isn't Flaunts's fault, and you know very well the castle's no longer enchanted. Cersei told us so on her last visit. Flaunts's ears perked up. That was why she had gone there. She was hoping for some news of Cersei. She didn't doubt her, sis her witch's power or ability to find their little sister, and she knew they were fine and they were in fine company with Ursula, sequestered away with their schemes, potions, and spells. But Flaunts wanted to help, and since Morningstar Castle was the last place Cersei had visit, visited before she took to paths unknown, Flaunts thought it was a good place to start. I don't care if he's married to the sweetest, most angelic girl in the world. I still don't trust him, Nanny bellowed, clearly still angry with the Beast Prince. Ignoring her nanny, Tulip turned her attention to her long-lost friend. My goodness, Flans, how did you get here? The silent beauty looked at Tulip with her black-rimmed golden eyes, but couldn't answer. Flans hoped that Tulip assumed she had been sent to her by someone at the castle. The princess didn't know Flans belonged to the Odd Sisters, of course, or the Odd Sisters were for that matter, or who the Odd Sisters were for that matter. Tulip had always assumed Flans lived in the court of the prin Beast Prince, and so she had, for a time, when it suited her mistresses. Can't we keep her, Nanny? You know how much I love her. I've often spoken about it. Flans rubbed her face against Tulip's and purred. I suppose, my dear, Nanny sighed, unable to deny her Tulip almost anything. But perhaps we will have Cersei take a look at her and make sure she was not sent for evil means. My goodness, Nanny, the way you talk. You'd think Cersei was some sort of witch that could do such things. Well, she is, my dear, a truer witch than I have ever met. Nonsense, Nanny. I won't have that sort of talk. Cersei is a dear friend, like a sister. Nanny sighed. Well, when she last, when she visited, visits next, it wouldn't hurt to ask what she thinks. Do you know if we're expecting her soon? She comes as she wishes. But it's been some time. Last she was here, she was trying to explain the virtues of trust and opening up to the idea of falling in love and all that rubbish again. As if I'd marry one of the arrogant fools who have been clamoring at the gates since the return of my beauty and fortune. I'd rather spend my days reading and learning something of the world, not trapped away in some man's castle at his beck and call. Nanny smiled at Tulip knowingly. Well, my dear... That is the last thing I want for you as well. But perhaps now you will find a young man who loves you not only for your beauty and fortune, but for your enchanting mind. Tulip wrinkled her nose in distaste, but Nanny continued, And if you do, my dear, I wouldn't be so quick to turn my nose up to, at him. Nanny put her hand at, on Tulip's cheek tenderly and looked deep into her sky-blue eyes. I dare say, whether you had lost your beauty or not, you would have realized your potential. You forget, Nanny sees into your heart, and she always knew there was an eager mind waiting to be filled with knowledge. Your beauty wasn't holding you back, my love. 
you were. I'm so happy you found yourself at last. Fawns thought Nanny was right. Her old friend Tulip had rather changed, and she liked it. She had never minded Tulip's silly, dim-witted nature. She had always found Tulip quite sweet, and loved the attention she heaped upon her. But this new Tulip had a sense of self what was interesting, and Fawns could tell she was going to enjoy Tulip's and indeed Nan Nanny's company more than ever.